continuing in our study in the book of Matthew. My thanks to Pastor Mike for filling in for me. He does such a great job. And I know he filled you in on what happened in that passage just before we got to this one. And he put it in context for you, letting you know that in one of the other Gospels, we read that there was a great argument that arose among the disciples after they'd come back from Mount Horeb. And Jesus asked them, what are you arguing about? And of course, Jesus never asks a question that he doesn't already know the answer to. But they said, well, we were arguing about which one is going to be the greatest among you. And I can imagine that Simon Peter probably was involved in that argument because he was such an outspoken guy. And we can see a little bit of that temperament of Simon Peter that hasn't yet had the rough edges chipped off of it just yet. And I can't help but wonder if perhaps he might have been the one that we're going to be seeing started to raise some of these questions because other people were angry at him because maybe he was the one thinking, well, I should sit at his right hand. I'm the natural leader among us, after all. I don't know that for a fact, but you can assume, based on the personality that we get a picture of with Simon Peter, he might have been that kind of guy. So Jesus uses that as a teachable opportunity, and we're going to look at what he teaches us about in this parable. Let me begin by sharing a story. I'll do the one-minute capsulized version. I shared the five-minute version several months ago. This happened when our son was just old enough to ride his bicycle to school a few blocks away. And he came up to me just before I was ready to leave to go to Southfield for a meeting with the State Convention of Michigan at that time because I was serving on a committee. So I had to drive all the way to Southfield and he came up in a huff and said, Dad, Dad, I lost my bike key. I can't unlock my, I can't unlock my bike so I can't go to school. And of course, being the compassionate, kind, warm, generous father, I blew up, and I gave him a sermon about why you shouldn't lose things, and why you should always keep track of them, and you should remember these things. This is important. You should remember this stuff. So now your mom's going to have to change her schedule. She's going to have to get you to school, and don't forget it the next time. We're going to probably have to find some sort of a bolt cutter and cut the lock off, and we'll have to buy another one, and that's going to cost money, and blah, blah, blah. you know, just, you know, sometimes we have those days in parenting. It's not the finest hour, I know, for my fatherhood, but I did that. And then I went to Southfield, and I had my meeting, and it was a difficult, lengthy meeting. And then I rushed out of the meeting as it was starting to sprinkle, and I wanted to get to my car in a hurry, and I drove all the way home, and I drove into my driveway and reached into the back seat for my briefcase, which was back in Southfield. And I realized that I had done exactly what my son had done, except in my briefcase was my paycheck which we had to put into the bank before we could eat. And so I had to load up the family and drive to South Lyon to meet somebody who was coming from Southfield, pull into this parking lot of a restaurant that we weren't going to go eat at. I pulled in and backed into my parking space, and he pulled in frontwards, and we kind of, he hands the, you know, briefcase through the window, and I grab it, and it was very surreptitious. So it kind of looked like a drug deal. (laughs) It felt kind of cool. And so I got the briefcase, but my my kids were like, Dad, how could you forget such a thing? And I thought, yeah, I know, you're supposed to remember stuff like that. So I told my son that night a particular story, and this is the story that I told him. It's what we're studying today. Jesus had a debt comparison, Matthew 18, 21 through 35. I invite you in whatever form of the Bible you brought with you to look at that. Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord... How many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? We'll find out how generous that was in a minute. And Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times, or in some translations, 70 times seven times. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold, other translations say 10,000 talents of gold, we'll look at that in a second, was brought to him. One year's salary, 20,000 bucks. This is an approximation in what it would be in today's economy, just to give you a sense of scale. Times 20, $200,000, so that would be like a talent of gold. Multiply that by 10,000 because it was 10,000 talents or 10,000 bags. 200 million bucks. Now, that's just a guesstimation. But we'll find out that what really is important here is not that we have an accurate figure, but the fact that it was insurmountable. It was huge. It was beyond imagination. Who could spend that kind of money? 
since he was not able to pay, I mean, who among us could, anyway? He was not able to pay. The master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold, which means into slavery, to repay the debt. At this, the servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. Could he really? In his lifetime, could he pay back 200 million bucks? And yet he's begging him for that. He's actually just asking for more time. The servant's master took pity on him, and this is where the story takes a a turn. He canceled the debt. He didn't just give him more time. He said, yeah, I'll give you 157 more years so you can try to pay it off. He canceled the debt. He forgave the entire thing and let him go. But when that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him 100 silver coins. How much is that in comparison? 100 denarii. A denarii would be like a a day laborer's or a minimum wage worker's daily wage. So that times 100, maybe about a third or fourth of a year's worth of wages, maybe 8,000 bucks or so in today's economy. It's still a sizable chunk, but it's not anywhere close to 200 million. And so he grabbed him and began to choke him. (laughs) Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. Same guy that was just forgiven 200 million. This guy owes him 8,000, and this was his reaction. His fellow servant fell to his knees, does this sound familiar? And begged him, Be patient with me and I will pay it back. Is it possible that this guy might be able to pay it back? Maybe so. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. Now, when the other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged and went and told their master everything that had happened. Nanny, nanny, nanny. They were tattletales. They saw something that was terribly unjust, and they didn't want to just let it lie. They were going to say, hey, we just saw this guy get forgiven this huge amount, and yet this is the way he's treating. That's not fair. So they went and told somebody about it. And then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said. I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. And this, Jesus says, is how my heavenly Father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. Think of the context. Think of the disciples. They've just seen Jesus do miracle after miracle. They go up on the Mount of Transfiguration. They hear God say with his own voice, This is my Son in whom I am well pleased. I love him. Listen to him. He is to be supreme in your life. And then they have an argument about who's going to be greatest in the kingdom. Haven't quite gotten it yet. So Jesus uses this teachable moment. So let's look at this now. Up to seven times. Why would Peter say seven times? The Jewish amount would have been three. There's some things in the Old Testament that kind of give us a three strikes and you're out mentality. So Peter may have been thinking, okay, seven is the, the perfect number. So if we double the three and give six and add one for good measure, seven is generous. And maybe he's thinking, I want a specific number because these yahoos that I have to put up with, my fellow disciples, have just really offended me. And I, I think I've just about reached the point at which I have no more forgiveness left. I am done with them. When I reach seven, I want to be able to say You know, seven strikes and you're out. I don't have to forgive you anymore. I'm going to put you on my blacklist. It seems like Peter was looking for specifics. Don't we do that with God sometimes? We're looking for specifics. And he's saying, no, let me tell you a little something about that. Parenting. What would happen, parents, if you had a specific number of times when you could forgive your children and then at that point you were able to say, sorry, nope, I'm not going to forgive you anymore. I'm going to throw you into prison until you can behave yourself and not do that thing I've been telling you all day long not to do. I just came back, our family just came back from visiting our two little cute grandsons that are practically perfect in every way. And I'm here to tell you, they're three and five. They sometimes put mom and dad to the test. Parenting, we understand what that's like sometimes. You can't put a number on that. I remember days when I crawl into bed exhausted at night when my kids were that preschool stage and I would think, The only thing I've done all day long is to reprimand and punish and discipline 
and forgive and punish and forgive and punish and forgive. And I'm worn out. Doesn't that feel that way sometimes? But we don't give up on our kids, do we? I hope not. Verse 22, 77 times versus 70 times 7. Does it make any difference? No, not really. It's a euphemism. It's a figure of speech. They put those numbers in there because anytime you use those specific kinds of numbers, it was meaning really just limitless. There's no limit to the number of times we should forgive somebody. Jesus sometimes did something on purpose. Well, he did everything on purpose all the time, but he did sometimes. He would say something that people who knew the Old Testament would get. They would have this little memory verse stuck in their brain, and they would hear what he's saying and connect it with that verse. And sometimes he would say it to mean the exact opposite. And so he'd be the converse, meaning that's what he does here. I think he's contrasting Matthew 18, 22 with an Old Testament passage from Genesis 4, 24. If Cain is avenged seven times, then Lamech 77 times. That was all about revenge. That was like, okay, I'm so vengeful that if we're going to have revenge, we're not going to just avenge him a little bit. We're going to go all the way. There's going to be no limit to our revenge. And he flips that on its head and says, no, I want you to forgive limitlessly. He's teaching the opposite of revenge here. Jesus was saying, quit counting. (laughs) Just stop counting, Peter. I want you to develop the attitude of forgiveness in your heart that says, if somebody comes to you seven times even in the same day, and appears to be genuinely remorseful for something, that you will continue to offer forgiveness to that person. True story about somebody who was offended in another church, not this one. One family was really grieved by how their daughter had been hurt by this person, and they asked to speak to Joy and me. So we had a little chat in the fellowship hall after church one day, and they said, we just want you to know, Pastor. And they kind of had that tone, you know, and you're thinking, ooh, this is not going to end well. We just want you to know, Pastor, that if she is allowed to come back in that church, that sinful one, that we're going to take our tithe and we're going to go elsewhere. And all this teaching that we're looking at in Matthew's gospel right now came flooding to the surface. And I thought, oh my goodness, you don't want to test God this way. I said, I know what Jesus would say. Jesus would say, stop counting. This person is genuinely remorseful. Yeah, she's hurt some people. She hurt us too. But she's remorseful and she's repentant and she's the exact kind of person that Jesus died for and we need to be the kind of church that welcomes her with open arms even if she goes back next week and does the same thing again we need to continue to welcome her with open arms to find true forgiveness because if the church is not a place where you can find forgiveness where can you so we told them said we're terribly sorry we pray that you won't make this kind of decision but we have to invite her in the Lord would want to do that and they said well we're we're going then And they left the church. And I can't help but wonder how miserable some of the time in their life has been because they walked away from truth, and I know that it was their own decision to make themselves a wandering wayfarer away from Christ and away from His teaching. They wandered right away from His truth. And I feel badly for them. I have compassion for them. I prayed for them when I thought about them because I want them to come to that place where they recognize, oh, that was terrible for us to feel that way. And I don't ever want our church to be that kind of church where we would keep somebody else out because they are a sinner. Doesn't the Bible also tell us that all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God? I'm a sinner. Verse 23, therefore, Pastor Mike would say, it's one of my favorite words. What is the therefore, therefore? That's what Jesus used to get right into that parable because he started teaching and then he said, therefore, and then he tells that story. The kingdom of God is like, and he tells this wonderful story about these two guys and their huge debt comparison. So what is the main point of that? You ready? (laughs) Our debt of sin forgiven by God is immeasurable. Our debt that God paid for us is absolutely immeasurable. You cannot put a human measuring stick on it. You can't put a value or a dollar value on what it cost him to make it possible for us to be reconciled with him. It's immeasurable. So in that case, there's another therefore coming in. Therefore, if we have been forgiven this much, shouldn't we forgive others in the same way? That's his whole point. There's nobody that doesn't deserve my forgiveness because God has certainly forgiven me. In verse 25, wife and children sold to repay debt. What's up with that? Jews would never do that. No, that's true. 
The Jews would never think of that. They would think that was cruel and unusual. So Jesus very often will tell stories that puts things in a context of the people in their social structure, things that they would have been very comfortable with and known, and they would have known that a Gentile leader or king would have done such a thing. In Jesus' day, when he was walking the face of the earth, there were no Jewish kings at that time. This was past the point when they had kings there. So the Roman government was there, might have had Gentile kings. There were some Roman uh, people who were trying to pay taxes. You know, we talked about that subcontractor, and they would have to go out and get people to pay taxes. That may have been what he's thinking about. And these people would have had that clearly in mind. Maybe there had been a tax collector walking by or even in the audience, and so they would go, oh, yeah, I can picture that. Could happen with a Gentile king. The reason I say that is it's important for us to not think that this parable is trying to say that God is the the meanie in that story. Some people might uh, read a parable a certain way and say, oh, but that kind of, we have to make God this king in this case. No, no, in the kingdom of heaven that he's talking about here, the king that he's referring to is an earthly king and it's probably a Gentile. Verse 26, at this the servant fell on his knees before the king. The same word for fell on his knees talks about a posture which means He was really making himself as a servant or worshiping, saying that you are of such worth and such value that I don't even dare stand in front of you, and so I'm going to kneel. And so the servant worshiped before that guy. He he didn't beg for forgiveness. You recognize that? He didn't beg for forgiveness. He said, please, pay off all of my debt. He begged for time, even though he probably knew that he was never going to have enough time in his lifetime to earn enough money to pay that kind of debt back. And as we saw in verse 7, the king didn't show patience, he showed mercy. The ruler canceled the debt and let him go. He absolutely turned this whole thing on its head and said, Nope, you're free, you may go. The man was forgiven but unforgiving. And that's what broke my heart about this family that met with me in that one church. I saw that they had been forgiven. They had even professed the fact that they had been forgiven. Some of the songs they sang talked about this forgiveness. They had been forgiven everything, and yet they were unwilling to forgive another human being. And I thought, ah. I don't know about you, but there are certain times when I feel like people are picking on me. And particularly if I'm busy looking at a text that I think is vital and important, and because my wife's not here today to defend herself, she's not feeling well, please pray for her. I'm going to get myself in trouble for this. (laughs) There will be times when she will say, did you hear what I just said? And I'll think, no. Uh, And I can't really make anything up because I I really didn't because I was looking at this text and I really wasn't paying attention. And so she'll sort of reprimand me for not living in the moment and actually paying attention to what she was saying. But then I've noticed a couple of times I would say something to her. And she would be looking at her phone, checking out her grandchildren on Facebook. And she didn't hear what I told her. So my tendency, the the fleshly human side of me, the sinful part of me, wants to say, I told you so. You're just like I am. You thought I was bad, but you're worse. I mean, isn't that what? I do the same thing with driving. I'll see somebody who's driving like an absolute, insert whatever, you know, word you want to put in there. I'll see somebody like that, and they just drive me up the wall, and I want to say, you need to learn how to drive. Why are you rah, 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 rah? And then three turns later, I look down just to change something, some music or something, and I look up and realize that I'm drifting across the little center line too, and I think, uh-oh. Well, that's different in my case. <laughs> we let ourselves off the hook, don't we? Isn't it so easy to see this infraction in somebody else, and yet we let ourselves off the hook? I see this happening in the disciples. I think Jesus sees it happening, not with cell phones and driving. I mean, they they might have had camels. I don't think they had to worry about cell phones and camels back then. But you can see that there's a transferable principle here. They are starting to look at picking at each other, and Jesus says, stop picking. Stop worrying about the pecking order. Stop worrying about keeping a baggage or keeping score. We used to call that gunny sacking. I think Paul Calmey's from Oklahoma used to call it gunny sacking. Don't use those infractions and save them up for use as ammo later in your discussions with your spouse or your roommate or that person that drives you nuts. You're not allowed to reach back in your gunny sack and pull out those past infractions and throw them in their face. Don't keep score. Quit keeping score. What did Jesus say earlier about forgiving? For if, this is an if-then statement, for if you forgive men when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their sins, what's going to happen? 
Your father will not forgive your sins. Yowza. That's the kicker. This is the verse I was trying to compassionately point out to that family. So you understand what you're doing. If you stiffen your neck and you stand up to God and say, I know you forgave me. I know you gave your life on a cross for me. But I'm going to take a pass on forgiving this person because I think their sin is worse than my sin. What does he promise you is going to happen? It's not going to end well. How would this parable help us relate to the previous passage about dealing with offenses? I've noticed this in context as well. I think it's interesting how some people would say, okay, uh, the Bible tells me very specifically that if my brother offends me, I'm supposed to go straight to that person before I start going and doing all the gossip because, you know, that's so much easier than to go straight face-to-face with that person who's offended me. What if we were to apply this passage that we just talked about, realizing that we've been forgiven so much, don't you think a lot of those little petty offenses would just disappear altogether? And we would just say, oh, that's nuts. I'm reading through this with my own selfish filter. I need not to worry about it. I'm going to let it go. I'm not going to tell that person, yeah, well, you're on Facebook, just like I was checking out my texts. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to let it go. And if we did that, then there'd be a whole lot less of the stuff that people would have to go face to face to their brother who offended you because all these mountains would be shrunk into little molehills. Don't you think that'd be a much better way to go about doing this stuff? I had a guy come up to me and gang, this is in another, I never use bad examples from this church because you never give me any. But again, different situation long time ago not more than a million miles from here guy had me out for coffee and he was upset and I could tell he was really upset about something and he he brought up something he'd been hanging on to this little petty thing for years that I had offended him somehow and I thought what did I do I I wasn't even aware of it apparently I failed to call on him to pray just before the offering and I used to try to choose different people when they come up to get the offering just take turns and he thought that was a big enough deal that he'd been ruminating on this and building it up into this big thing and he was afraid that somehow I was punishing him for something or whatever and I no I just forgot and I'm really sorry and I, I think we patched things up okay but I thought wow you really stewed on this for that long I probably would have just forgotten all about it the next time I got up to do the offering I would have thought okay yeah he just he's busy he's got a lot of stuff going on in that crazy ADD brain of his no big deal. But you see, if we hang on to stuff like that, and if we gunny sack it, and if we keep ruminating on it and building it out of proportion, then we're going to be like those disciples were when they came down off of Mount Horeb, and we're going to start picking at each other. So, to, to say it the way Mike would say it, just stop it. How'd I do, Mike? Okay. Don't gunny sack it. Don't pick at each other. Don't worry about trying to point out somebody's flaws bigger than yours. It's the old speck in the beam kind of thing, you know. Man, that sure is a big old speck in your eye. And we got this big old two by four hanging out of our own. Let me read, because this is a great comparison between two stories that I'm going to wrap up with. I just found this out. It's from an older book that I'd read years ago from Max Lucado. In his book, In the Grip of Grace, Max shares this story about a guy named Kevin Tunnel or tunnel, I'm not sure how he pronounces it, but it's T-U-N-E-L-L. Kevin had been given a court order to put a check in the mail every week for one dollar, one dollar, and send it to this one particular family. And he was supposed to do that for a total of 936 weeks. That was the court order. In case you're doing the math, that's 18 years. Let me tell you why. That family expected to receive a check in the mail every Friday so Kevin would not forget what happened on the first Friday of 1982. That's the day Kevin's car struck and killed their daughter. She was 18. He was 17. They wanted him to suffer by remembering that every week of his life and not just paying a fine off and then being able to put it out of his mind. And so the court order, even though they won a $1.5 million settlement, They said, no, no, we're going to do something because we know he'll never be able to pay that off. Kind of sounds like this parable, right? It's like $200 million to him. He could never pay off that. So they said, okay, we'll settle for $936, and he can make one payment a week for 18 years because they wanted him to do that for as long as their daughter had been alive. Kevin has complied with every part of that sentence, including campaigning against drunk driving, speaking to high school classes and whatnot, and he did that well beyond the one year that was the court order for community service. He did it for seven years. 
Why? Because he believes in the message. He said, what I did is terrible. You don't want to have to live with the guilt that I have to live with every day of my life. Don't drink and drive. And he would share that with students. But Kevin kept forgetting to send the dollar. And when he remembered to send the check, it would get deposited into a special fund that was starting to grow as a scholarship fund in their daughter's name. And the family had taken Kevin to court. In fact, they took him to court three times for not complying with that particular part of his sentence, the dollar a week. After the fourth time when he failed to comply, they actually put him in jail for 30 days. And we might think to ourselves, well, yeah, he's not complying with the court order. He killed their daughter. Certainly, he should at least be able to do that. He's forgetting to do even that. But listen to what Kevin has to say. He says, I'm not trying to defy the court order. I'm haunted every day of my life by the death that I inflicted on this family. And I just, I can't stand the reminders. It's haunting me to the point that it hurts to write out that check. Of course, that was the family's point. After his jail sentence, Kevin offered to pay for the entire court-ordered amount. He said, if you want one check per dollar, I'll do two boxes of checks. I'll fill every check out for one dollar and just give you both boxes. That's going a year beyond. It'll be for 19 years. They said, no, nope, it's got to be every week. They were holding him to that. They refused. Now, if we put ourselves in the place of the family, we might think, well, sure, this makes sense. The guilty should be punished. But then you start to think about the bitterness that grows over the years of unforgiveness, and we start to say, okay, will 936 payments be enough? If they finally receive the final payment, is that going to finally bring peace into their lives? Are they going to finally be able to let go all that resentment that they've held for the guy who killed their daughter? Max Lucato doesn't think so, and I don't either. I think when we continue to keep score, when we continue to demand justice, demand repayment for every offense against us, we develop angry, bitter, toxic spirits. And we live our lives clouded by that unforgiveness that affects every other area of our lives. And we can't let go and start living because we're always concentrating on what's unforgiven. Now, contrast that with the lady that I had shared with you about. I got to meet her through a cousin of mine who is a, an assistant district attorney. Now she's a judge. She was an assistant district attorney in Portales, New Mexico at the time. And she saw this case through. Vicki Dixon is the lady who got a phone call and said, uh, Miss Dixon, we need you to come immediately to follow us because we need to find out if this is your house and what's going on. And she said, what's happening? Apparently, there were seven different crime scenes around Portales. One of them was at the home that looked like a break-in to her parents' house. They started following up on it. A detective kept her posted throughout this 24-hour ordeal. Turns out we found the car. It's been taken somewhere. We don't know where it is. And then somebody else got a report of a car on fire at the edge of town. They followed up on that. It was their car. Turns out, awful story, her parents were in the trunk of that burning car. And then, to make matters worse, she found out eventually that it was her own cousin who had broken into her parents' house, his aunt and uncle, looking for drug money. He had to take care of them somehow. So he tortured them, tied them up with duct tape, eventually threw him in the trunk of that car, drove it out to the edge of town, doused it with gas, and set the whole thing on fire. Now, if anybody had any reason to be resentful and bitter, I would think it would be Vicky. I think Vicky would have lots of reason to say, I want this person to rot in that prison cell for as many years as he possibly can because no amount of time is going to be enough to pay him back. Wouldn't that be a normal reaction from somebody? She studied this stuff that we're studying in the Gospels. And she said, I know that God was convicting me even soon after this event that if I can't let go and if I can't forgive, I'm going to be the one who's going to self-destruct because I can't live with this toxin in myself. So she actually wrote a very eloquently worded response in the sentencing, stood up at the sentencing of her own cousin and forgave him publicly. She said, I understand you still have to pay the consequences. You're going to be in prison a lot of time. But that's a good thing because hopefully if you're in prison for enough time, maybe if you'll read this, and she gave him a Bible, and they allowed her to give him a Bible to take in with them. She marked a lot of passages and stuff. If you'll take this and read it, I want you to find the kind of forgiveness that I know God has for everybody because there's nothing that you could have done that God won't forgive, and I want you to be in heaven forever. 
completely forgiven and completely whole. Wow. So on one hand, we have a family that wants to make this guy suffer for 18 years. And on another, we have a lady who's literally forgiving publicly her cousin for doing such a heinous thing to her parents. I'm still friends with her on Facebook. And she has such a positive outlook on life. You look at the posts and you look at all the things she says I'm so grateful for and I had some time with my grandkids today. She's got a great outlook. Why is that? Because she let go that bitterness and she forgave. Jesus doesn't want us to forgive people for their benefit. It does benefit them, surely. He wants us to forgive for our benefit. He understands that when we do that, we're the ones who grow. We're the ones who get to finally experience the freedom that God wants us to experience. And it comes through just letting that bitterness go and saying, I forgive you. If God forgave me all that he forgave me, certainly I can forgive as he forgave me. I pray we'll be that kind of people, as difficult as it is. Humanly, it's impossible. But we've got God to do it through us because of his Holy Spirit making it possible for us to let go of that unforgiveness and forgive even people that we think shouldn't be forgiven. Let's pray together. Father, it's a tough subject. It's a really tough subject because all of us have been struck with some sort of offense at some point in our life, some of them difficult offenses. And it's difficult to forgive. And yet we can see evidence, not just in Scripture, although that's a, that should be enough for all of us, but we can see people who are living according to Scripture, who are being transformed by your Holy Spirit to the point that they're exemplifying this kind of unusual spirit manifested forgiveness for people who have done horrible things and they're living such free lives and they're so light in their spirit and they're shining the light of Jesus to other people and I pray that we will each see the need to forgive every offense so that we're not keeping score that it's limitless just as your love for us is limitless we pray in Jesus name